Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So thanks for joining uh, this webinar session brought to you by Denali. Uh, so today you're going to be virtually transported to our lab uh, for a brief tour. Um, and then you'll hear from six of uh, members from the Denali team to get a sense of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then we'll end uh, the session with a live Q&A with several of these panelists. Um, so Molly and Karen, who are on with us, uh, will be happy to take your questions. Um, so please don't hesitate uh, to ask them throughout the session. Um, and then lastly, I want to have a little promo for our second session offered today at 2 p.m., Defeating Degeneration Session 2, uh, brought to you by Robert Thorne and uh, Meredith Calvert. And this uh, will be a brain anatomy and microscopy uh, tutorial. So please um, stay on and, and join us for that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start a brief intro video. Thanks. Welcome to Denali's virtual booth at the Bay Area Science Festival. We are a company that is situated in South San Francisco and dedicated to developing therapies against a very devastating set of disorders known as neurodegenerative diseases. This includes Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and ALS, among others. So today, we have two exciting sessions in store for you. The first will take you into our labs for a virtual tour. You'll also meet a fantastic set of scientists and MDs that are driving a lot of the research and clinical work done at our biotech company. Our second session will give you a macroscopic and microscopic view of the human and rodent brain. We'll see how a human and rodent brain compare against one another and how mouse models can be used to understand these different diseases. And then finally, we'll take a dive into hands-on home activities. So let's begin. Hi everyone. So after watching our demonstrations from Dr. Robert Thorne and Dr. Meredith Calvert, I hope you're ready to dive in to do some neuroscience at home. So today we have two activities for you, which you'll, you will find in our uh, digital content. Um, the first is a build your own neuron at home. So in my demonstration, I have pipe cleaners, but you can use anything you find at home, like recycled materials, such as straws, popsicle sticks, or even candy. So if you click on the worksheet, you'll find some information about what a neuron looks like. So neurons are the building blocks of the brain. And you'll find some instructions on how to build all the different parts of the neuron. So using pipe cleaners, you'll make little circles that represent the nucleus or the brain of the cell and other parts of the neuron. Our second activity is a build your own brain hat. So you'll also find templates that look like this, which you can print out either um, a larger size or just a letter size. And this will allow you to build your own brain at home. So here you'll be able to cut out this template and fold it and glue it into the shape of a hat that you can wear. And on one side of the brain, you'll see all the different functions of different parts of our brain. This section helps us learn and remember, and this section helps us um, for, for seeing. Um, and on the other half of the brain, you'll, you can read about what goes wrong when different parts of the brain are affected by diseases. So we hope you'll enjoy these neuroscience at home activities. Thanks. Um, so now I'm going to show you all sort of our main feature, which is a lab tour, as well as a panel interview. If you're just joining us, welcome.
So my name is Carol Ho, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Head of Development at Denali Therapeutics. As a Chief Medical Officer of a company, you're responsible for all of the clinical trials, uh, patient safety, and then also communication of patient-relevant data, both to scientific communities, to investors, and also um, to, to patients and families. Yeah, so a typical day for me is different every day, and I love that about this job. And the reason that it's different is that there are different issues that come up when you're developing a medicine. Sometimes there are issues that are very um, basic science research oriented in terms of understanding the mechanism of the target that we're going after and understanding how to make sure that the, the medicine is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Other days, the discussion is with other physicians and clinicians and thinking through who are the patients that are going to respond to the medicine? What are their characteristics? What are their clinical characteristics? What kinds of symptoms are they having? There are other days where um, a lot of the time is spent through internal meetings as we're thinking about how to build the organization and bring in all of the expertise that we need, need um, in this collaborative process to, to uh, develop a medication. But I would say that the consistent theme in my day-to-day -day work is working with a team of people with very different expertise and putting all of that, those different perspectives together to collaboratively develop medicines. I would say probably one of my biggest career obstacles was finding the way to do what I wanted to do today, which is to develop medicines for patients. I think um, through my training um, in academic environments, there was always an interest in, in, in doing this. However, um, the collaborative nature that you really have in an industry setting where you bring together everybody with the same goals to develop a medicine, I really only found when I uh, joined industry about 15 years ago. I think in an industry environment, everybody has the same goal. It is to bring a medicine to patients. And that, that has been, you know, I think for me, one of the most gratifying things about working in, in this sort of environment and something that took time to really find this, this environment to be able to do that. Yeah, so I grew up in the Midwest, um, in the middle of cornfields and um, I grew up in a family where my father was a physician, um, and specifically he was a pathologist. Uh, my mother was a musician, so very different uh, backgrounds for my parents. Our dinner conversations would be focused on um, natural phenomena and science. He would often ask questions like, when it's cold, why is there, why is there fog on a window? Um, when we would actually prepare turkey for Thanksgiving, we would actually dissect the turkey and look at all of the joints. Um, that passion at home led to an interest at school and in my subsequent education. And so I do think it's so important for young people today to get that exposure. Um, that exposure brings that interest that lives with you for the rest of your life. Diversity is so important in uh, collaborative work. I think when you have diversity, you have different ideas that come to the table. You have an environment that fosters different viewpoints and discussion, different expertise, different backgrounds. So for me, when I look at a team, diversity is really important. And that means gender diversity, racial diversity, and again, education background diversity. The challenges with neurodegeneration development at this time, I think largely lies in an, a, an, an issue that we're addressing, uh, getting therapeutics into the brain, and then also identifying those mechanisms that are going to have an impact on the disease. I think a third area that is a challenge is that by the time patients know they have the diseases, um, the disease is often fairly advanced. And at that point, being able to change the trajectory of the disease and bring back neurons that have died or degenerated can be very challenging. I think the future for us holds in being able to ensure that we get these therapeutics across the brain, but also in being able to detect patients early that have these diseases and get these treatments to them before the disease advances to the point where it is difficult to recover lost neurons or prevent
further um, degeneration of neurons. I'm Kimberly Scarce Levy. I'm the Vice President of Translational Sciences, which is it's quite a mouthful, but that, that really just means that my group works on trying to find the right way to take the drugs that we discover and um, test them in the clinic and understand, apply the discoveries that we've made to running better and more successful clinical trials. I think that one obstacle that all scientists face is you're going to have a time in your career where things just aren't working. You um, your experiments aren't definitive or you're trying to set up a new technique and it's not working or uh, your hypothesis isn't correct. This is something that's part of science um, and we all have to face it and we all have to approach these obstacles and setbacks with curiosity and that openness to learning and say, okay, I, I, I did an experiment. Um, I learned that I was wrong. I learned that I don't quite understand all the things I need to do to get this to work and to just be willing to turn around and say, well, what can I do next to figure it out? The thing that really stands out in my mind as the time when I started thinking that maybe I could be a science person um, instead of a, a word person, shall we say, was my freshman year of high school where we all were required to do a, a science project for the science fair. Um, and it came out really well. I wound up winning my county science fair. And I think that's what really started me thinking, hey, this, this was a pretty fun, satisfying experience, and, and maybe this is what I want to do with uh, the rest of my life. Uh, I, I think, as you know, whenever you have a tough problem to solve, the more different perspectives, the more different kinds of thinking, the more um, different ideas you can bring to it, the better you're going to be. Uh, that's one advantage. Another advantage is it's it's just more fun to work with people who are different. Um, it would be pretty boring if you were always working with and talking to people who are just like yourself. So it's much more satisfying and interesting to work with people who are from other countries, other backgrounds, other races. Um, you can learn a lot from them both professionally and personally. I think the hardest barrier right now is just the lack of success that the field has had to date. Um, we don't know how to say set up positive controls for our experiments. We don't know how to design, um, well, well, how to have the right kind of endpoints in our clinical trials that can measure improvement. Um, and we don't know uh, what sort of changes in the body or the brain will correlate with better memory or better function in patients with neurodegeneration. And so I think the, um, the big challenge is we need to start having some successes. It can be from my company, it can be from another company that will help us understand and, and shed light on the right path to do this. So my name is Vikram Sisodia, and um, I lead the bioprocess development group at um, Denali. And uh, what bioprocess development entails, uh, we are essentially putting together a series of recipes to be able to produce our medicines in very large quantities, um, enough to be able to supply clinical trials and eventually um, enough to go into the market and, and provide um, a lot of medicine to our patients. So some of the obstacles that I faced, um, you know, coming from uh, an undergrad, which wasn't chemical engineering focused and entering a, a field that is predominantly engineering, 
um, that was a bit of a challenge at the beginning. Um, so I, I don't have a PhD. Um, so I graduated with a master's in chemical engineering and my first foray into uh, uh, process development and also manufacturing was an internship. Um, at a, a pretty major uh, biological or a biotech company here in the Bay Area, um, which you know, to me, having come from a, a, a program that wasn't very well known, uh, I didn't have a lot of exposure into opportunities. But I happened to learn about that internship. I uh, I know it was very competitive. I was lucky enough to get that internship, and that changed the course of my life. So my first uh, experience with STEM was uh, probably a high school biology course. Um, that was probably in my sophomore year where we were studying microbiology. And, uh, you know, just reading about the cell and how it functions. And, and to, at that point, you know, I think it was, I was completely, my mind was blown at the fact that there was something so complicated. It was a machine that did such intricate work and for it to be so small, and, you know, being the essence of who we are, uh, you know, and then our bodies being uh, composed of billions of these things. Uh, I think that's what opened my eye up into science. Diversity is very important, uh, especially in a field like ours where, you know, we have a team with experiences that come from not only different companies, but different uh, uh, academic labs, uh, different uh, areas of, of uh, discipline as well. So we've got engineers and scientists that work together. Um, and more so than that, even different life experiences. Um, and you know, I find that diversity is, is very important when making decisions. Um, you have a lot of different viewpoints and perspectives on the same thing. But because our minds are all shaped by our different experiences, our different exposures, um, diversity is key in making sure that we consider everything out there when making a decision. So the largest barrier to defeat neurodegeneration is getting a therapeutic into the brain. Um, and that's where, you know, Denali is really leading the charge with uh, the blood-brain barrier um, transfer technologies. Um, the other challenge is going to be once we figure out how to get things into the brain is getting enough of what we're trying to dose into the brain as well. Um, and so, you know, these, these, both of these things present a pretty huge challenge in, in how we will treat things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in the future, which may require very large doses um, and, and being able to efficiently find a way to get these therapies across the blood-brain barrier, but to a concentration that is meaningful. Uh, my name is Sunette Davis, and I am a scientist at Denali. I am a scientist in the uh, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics group in developmental sciences. Yeah, so as far as schooling, um, so I did a bachelor in biochemistry, so that was four years. And then I did a PhD in analytical chemistry, which was six years. And then um, I did additional training um, that was about two years, but then after that training, I moved on to Denali. If a day could look like working on a group project with your friends, that's what my day would be like. It's like, meeting so we're getting together we're all from different specialties um, we're getting together to discuss you know what the what the what the question is a scientific question and then how we plan to solve it our experimental design then we'll like break we'll all do our independent um, experiments um, we'll do our independent like reading research either like reading scientific literature or either doing um visually watching like a scientific seminar and then we'll meet back together with our results and prepare some sort of like visual either like a presentation which we'll then all provide to our colleagues so it's like one big group project after another after another i 
I think one that's very close, I would say is um, imposter syndrome. So feeling that, like just a feeling of inadequacy, even though, you know, despite evidence of success, like you just feel like, like you're not enough or you're not doing enough. Um, and I think that's one I think I've struggled with leading up to my career and all through like different stages of um, like my academic transition. Um, but I would say, um, I don't know. I just remind myself that it's a feeling and it's not fact because you know, the facts differ. <laughs>
yeah, like it, it won't be very balanced. I think that's the same in, in a STEM environment if we don't have people coming from all different backgrounds, um, all different training levels, different ages, people who look different. Um, and I think bringing all those both personal experiences and training um, into a workplace when it's really diverse, you have different ideas, um, you have new ideas, people building off of each other's ideas instead of going into, um, let's say, an echo chamber where everyone's thinking the same thing, no one's really cross-checking what another person is saying. So I think, yeah, there's tremendous value in having people come from all sorts of backgrounds to, to work together to tackle a problem that's as difficult as uh, neurodegeneration. We just don't know that much about how the brain works. So imagine you have a computer that's broken and you're trying to fix it, but you don't know how a functioning computer really works. You don't know how all the you know, circuits connect together until we really understand how it functions at the basic level. It's going to be difficult to try to return it to that functioning level. So I think, you know, this is a huge collaborative effort between um, biotech companies and drug developers, um, but also basic researchers like in a university kind of coming together to both figure out how the, the normal functioning brain works, but also to have clinicians and doctors and, and researchers help diagnose the dysfunctional brain and once you know we have these two pieces moving in parallel, we can kind of converge. And um, yeah, it's a huge collaborative effort to, to solve a really difficult um, problem. My name is Molly Jacobs and I'm a scientist in the AAV group at Denali. So I did my bachelor's at the University of Florida. I also did my PhD there as well. I did a short postdoc at Stanford. So a typical day for me at Denali is looking at different components of gene therapy. So when we are working with virus here at Denali, we have different ways to deliver genes um, into patients using this virus. So we can design those genes we can produce the virus that expresses those, and we can quantitate how well we're doing that. One of the greatest professional difficulties for me to overcome was I really never thought that I could be a scientist. When I was growing up in Florida, there weren't a lot of really great examples or science outreach programs that were available for me. And it wasn't until right around when I was about to graduate that I started working in a lab and I realized that that was what I really loved to do. But for me, I was really a latecomer to science and I felt like for a while I was playing catch up, trying to get back um, to the level of experience that a lot of my peers who knew that they were going to do this, you know, from a very early age had. Well, you know, so I think uh, to overcome that, it really took a long time. It took a lot of effort. Uh, I think when it was when I started graduate school and, you know, when you start a graduate program, you're uh, exposed to a lot of different uh, colleagues, a lot of other students that have really different backgrounds. And it was then that I realized, you know, I wasn't really behind um, in any way. It was really, did I have the, the scientific drive or the, the curiosity to be successful in science? Yeah, so in high school there, um, you know, in Florida, there's not a lot of, well, at the time, there wasn't a lot of scientific research in the area. So my first exposure to STEM didn't really happen until I was um, an undergrad. And there was, you know, a lot of research going on at the University of Florida. And so as luck would have it, I was looking for a part-time job and I ended up working in a lab. And the more time I spent there, the more interested in research that I got, and that's ultimately what pushed me in the direction to attend graduate school. I think the value of having diversity in science is that if you keep asking the same people the same types of questions, you're never going to come up with new and innovative approaches. 
I think it's when you reach out to people with a different background, a different viewpoint, that you really find really useful, really innovative, and really valuable suggestions. So I think the biggest barrier for defeating neurodegeneration is really you know, the, the complexity of the disorders that we're studying. And I think that's why being at Denali is really great is they're really focused on a lot of discovery biology efforts that help us better understand the diseases and help us design better drugs to treat these diseases. Okay, um, so now we will go ahead and uh, start our Q&A. Thank you so much for watching our videos. Uh, so we are joined again by Molly and Karen, who are both featured in the video. And so you can ask questions directly to them or more general questions. Uh, so we already have one um, in the Q&A. So do wild mice naturally have any neurodegenerative diseases? What changes in brain function do you try to induce in your animal models to simulate human neurodegenerative diseases? Um, these are awesome. Uh, so would one of you like to take a first stab? There are two, two separate questions. Yeah, I think um, probably in the wild, um, you would see mice or other animals deteriorate with age, but I think more likely you would see maybe physical deterioration um, I think animals that, I don't know, do we think they, they live long enough to be able to get these age-related diseases? And do we think they'd be able to survive in the wild if they did? What do you guys think? Yeah, so I, so I think the mice that we typically use are, are extremely inbred. Um, so a lot of times they'll actually carry mutations uh, because they're so genetically similar that makes them more prone to disease. So I would think that, you know, wild type or uh, sort of wild mice would be perhaps a little bit uh, more resilient uh, to certain diseases. Uh, I'm not really sure about neurodegenerative diseases, but I do know that um, there are uh, sort of rodents. I want to say the naked mole rat is like one of these weird models where we don't even know um, how old uh, they get, and they seem to actually be somewhat pr protected uh, from neurodegeneration. Um, so that's sort of uh, all I can speak to that question. I don't know if uh, either one of you have anything to add about sort of the vulnerability to neurodegeneration um, in wild mice. I don't think that's really, uh, at least to my knowledge, studied extensively. Yeah, exactly. I don't think people have kind of chased after older mice in the wild to, to see how they fare. But I think in the lab, what we try to do to simulate human disease is sometimes we can introduce mutations that cause the human disease into the mice. So say we know a certain gene will cause Alzheimer's disease or make people more prone to Alzheimer's disease, we can introduce that specific human gene into a mouse and try to get the mouse to make um, a, a protein or um, yeah, I'll try to get the mouse to produce some kind of, um, yeah, perturbation that will cause disease in, in the mouse. And we can try to test um, cognitive function in mice by designing a lot of little mazes or little tasks that mice or rodents can do. So we can see if this gene that we introduced to the mouse is making their cognitive function worse? Are they worse at remembering how to exit the maze or how to push the right button for a little piece of peanut butter? Um, so yeah, so that gives us a nice model in a mouse um, in the lab where we can then um, see if our drugs can, can help fix. So that's usually how we would um, use the mouse model in our labs to ask some of these questions. Molly, do you have anything else to add? To that? No, I think you guys did a great job answering. I think one thing that's particularly tough with neurodegeneration is we still don't really know what is sort of part of the pathology. So something that happens later downstream and what's the cause. And sometimes it's hard to sort of tease 
apart the sequence of events. And, and so we can learn from the genetics and like Karen is saying, we can sort of use what we know about the genetics to simulate that in a mouse model, but there might be aspects of these diseases um, that you know are unknown in terms of sort of in, in trying to induce that in a mouse um, or to induce multiple factors. Uh, great question. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, I don't see, and I'll give you guys another minute to ask questions. Um, I guess in the meantime, as we're waiting, um, so Molly, uh, in terms of, so Denali, uh, oh, well, there's another question. Okay. Um, I was going to ask something about the blood brain barrier, but that can, uh, that can wait. So another question, um, I watched the Denali afternoon presentation yesterday, and they mentioned that only 20% of our brain's neurons are found outside the cerebellum. What types of cells or structures make up our brains outside of our cerebellum? Um, so I believe, so the question sort of referring to the percentage of neurons in the cerebellum versus other brain structures and what other types of cells uh, compose these other parts of our brains? That's another very astute question. Uh, who wants to take a stab at this? <laughs> sure, I can try. So, <laughs> so I know we call our field neuroscience and that's very neuron centric. So we're always thinking about neurons as being the only brain cells that are helping our brains function. But actually our brain, our brains are made up of many, many different kinds of cells. So other cells you might hear about are astrocytes. So these are, for a long time, they were thought of as the glue of the brain. They were kind of the supportive cells that kept everything together. They filled up a lot of the spaces and they were able to soak up things that other cells spit out. So kind of this buffering type of cell that holds the, the brain together. But now we know that astrocytes can also signal to each other. So they're able to talk to each other. Um, we can see them have kind of if you image them um, with the right kinds of dyes, you can see them flash with um, calcium dyes. So we know they're talking, we know they can kind of connect one part of the brain to another because we see these waves of calcium flow through the brain. Um, that's one type, another type is microglia. So these you can think of as the immune cells of the brain. So these are cells that can um, kind of eat up things, eat up debris and, and garbage that's in the brain. Um, it, it kind of is the inf inflammatory cell in the brain. So it can also, um, yeah, in addition to eating up dead, dead cells or cells that shouldn't be there, it can secrete or um, spit out some chemicals that will activate or inhibit cells around it. Um, we have oligodendrocytes. These are myelin generating cells. So they kind of insulate these long skinny processes of the neurons to help the neurons talk to each other faster. So you can think of it, if you have like a, a wire, um, you know, like a wire like this that you're connecting, um, it's always insulated with a layer of, um, of, of rubber or plastic. So oligodendrocytes are forming this insulating layer around um, the processes of neurons. So these are three important cell types that I can think of other than neurons that exist in the brain. Molly, would you like to add, because um, I know that the brain really does a very good job sort of protecting itself from infection and, and pathogens. And so it's thought to be immune privileged. So um, there aren't as many uh, sort of resident immune cells that get into the brain. Um, and so there's sort of, um, scaffolding in place to really prevent entry of a lot of proteins and other cells um, that would normally recognize these things. And that's why it becomes so difficult to treat um, disorders of the brain. And, and Molly's sort of an expert in, in sort of ways to bypass this. So yeah, would you like to take a stab? Absolutely. So one of the things that we're trying to do with AEV or adeno-associated virus at Denali is to harness the capacity of this virus to cross the blood-brain barrier and to deliver therapeutics to the brain. So when we think about how to do this, AEV itself is surrounded by a shell of a, a protein coat 
And this protein coat can recognize receptors and be internalized into different cell types. And that's why you know, we wanna think about all of these different types of cells in the brain and what cells we wanna deliver our therapeutics to. So one of our projects is we're thinking about how to target these cell types in the brain is how can we modify this capsid? How can we change the sequence to recognize these cell type specific receptors? So we know that when we're using AEV to deliver a therapeutic, we're targeting a very limited or very specific part of the brain. Awesome, yeah. Any other questions? I thought we had a really good question yesterday. If there aren't, oh, there's one. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like we just, every time we just wait a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, knowing all you do about the brain and neurodegenerative diseases, do you have any lifestyle change recommendations beyond basic sleep, nutrition, and exercise? I was going to say I would say sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Beyond sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Hmm. Those would be the main ones. So we know that exercise, for instance, increases neurogenesis. Um, and so that's sort of the birth of new neurons in, in regions that are still turning over, which um, there's fewer of those regions in the adult brain. Um, and then, then sleep, of course, there's this literature that sort of points to clearing out the brain through this system called the glymphatic system. But um, I feel like I'm dodging your question a bit. I don't know. Do you all know of any other sort of lifestyle changes beyond these three sort of factors? Uh, I would say that one that I've heard often recommended is, is actually just using your brain. So if you use your brain to do things like puzzles and crosswords and even playing video games, something where you're kind of challenging your brain to solve little problems is going to help you. Because um, you can imagine it's like, if you never use your muscles in your arms or your legs, those muscles are going to shrink and deteriorate and then um, you won't be able to use those muscles very well. It's the same with your brain cells. So um, there's a saying, um, neurons that, that fire together, wire together. So basically the more you're using certain um, brain cells to kind of think about certain problems, the more they get linked together and kind of you're building little highways between cells in your brain. So the more you use them, the more of these networks you build and that's going to help your, your um, memory and your learning and your cognitive abilities just kind of stay um, um, intact longer. So yeah, kind of just solving little puzzles, doing fun things, using your brain. I think that's, um, yeah, an easy way to incorporate that into your, into your day. Yeah, it's almost interesting these disorders of aging utilize and, and sort of um, the same principles that can be applied during brain development are really applied sort of later in life as well. So you sort of hear, I have a toddler and you sort of hear about, you know, language immersion during like the critical period, um, you know, when they're like two or three years old, because that's sort of when a lot of synapses are being pruned and connections are being formed and refined. And so what Karen's saying about sort of keeping your brain active and, and training in older age is sort of the same types of processes that are occurring, um, you know, as we're sort of uh, refining uh, the circuits in our brain um, as, as little ones. Uh, so this is sort of a follow-up. Is there a specific kind of exercise that's helpful? Um, so maybe we could answer this in the context of like Parkinson's disease or diseases that sort of involve um, you know, also uh, sort of loss of motor function. Do either one of you want to take this question or add to? I don't know about specific kinds of exercises, but sort of the utility of exercise in general. I would say just any exercise is better than none. So anything that will get you, you know, walking or running or um, your heart rate up. Yeah, anything is is even standing at your desk when you're working or taking up to take a standing break while you're working or taking Zoom classes or anything like that. Anything is better than, um, than nothing. 
Yeah, and actually, I think it was a couple of months ago, our, our company does seminars every now and then where we um, sort of uh, invite folks that are, you know, actual patients or families of patients. And we had a really awesome set of individuals uh, that were Parkinson's patients. And they sort of spoke about their experience, but specifically there was uh, sort of an exercise fitness program that they were all um, a part of. I don't know if you remember this, Karen or Molly, um, but but basically these, these folks are really incredible. Um, so they were doing a lot of sort of strength training and, and really um, very devoted to uh, sort of, uh, I guess, reducing the, the progression and the severity of their diseases uh, with these sort of guided programs that were specifically um, for people with Parkinson's. I don't remember the exercises though. Um, I don't know if you all remember that, but, but there are resources like that available um, for people with you know, ALS and Parkinson's uh, to sort of uh, provide that kind of uh, therapeutic support outside of uh, sort of medication. Um, okay, does your company mostly study animals or do you work with a lot of patients? Yeah, so we do a lot of preliminary studies in animals. There's a lot that we need to be able to look at from a safety and efficacy um, perspective that, you know, is really important to clarify before we move into a patient population. But at Denali, we do also work um, a fair amount with patients as well, once we've established all of the safety parameters. Exactly. Yeah, everything from preclinical research is what we call what we um, doing animals all the way through to clinical trials is, um, you know, we span you know, this whole um, this whole range of of um, drug development at our company. Um, so another question uh, that's actually coming from us internally. Uh, so do video games sort of constitute, uh, you know, is this within the realm? Um, of the challenges and puzzles that you were talking about, Karen, um, in terms of beneficial sort of brain exercise. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of companies that you might have heard of that target this specific niche in the um, in the kind of neuro recovery um, or neuro protection market. So you might have heard of um, Lumosity or these little games that you can play on your phone. And they're actually pretty fun. Um, and they challenge you to use certain parts of your brain like attention or memory um, or association. So they're designed to kind of specifically exercise um, certain parts of your brain and certain functions. And yeah, I mean, video games that you would play or computer games naturally have a lot of these. Um, challenges built in. So I would say, yeah, absolutely. Gaming and video games is definitely something that I'd consider exercise for the brain. Are there any more questions going in? If not, Molly, if you wanna recite the question that you were thinking about from yesterday. Oh yeah, sure. So I thought, you know, it was interesting. Someone had asked, um, what was the most fun project or like the coolest project that you've had a chance to work on at Denali? And I thought that was a really interesting question because we do, you know, so much that's really narrowly focused, but it is at the same time a really fun job. So I'm just curious what, for the two of you, what you think the most fun project that you've worked on is. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, let me think about that. Tanya, if you have one, you can go first. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, and there'll be the same answer from yesterday, but I think this is largely <laughs> a new audience. Um, yeah, so for me, I would say, you know, while I've been at Denali, I think any project that lends to lots of collaboration is typically my most favorite uh, project. So, uh, we're, uh, Karen and I are both part of sort of underneath the umbrella of biology and discovery. Uh, we both sort of work on projects on glia. So we were mentioning microglia and astrocytes as these other cell types. 
um, in the brain uh, and they can actually be, you know, controlled to uh, change the progression of some of these neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so a lot of times, uh, you know, even without focusing on like specific targets, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how can we control these cells to do the things we want them uh, to do? And so it used to be, I think, in the field of, of glia that it was thought that microglia and astrocytes you know, really promoted inflammation. They were bad. So, you know, it how you would think about them in the context of sort of infectious disease. Um, but in the context of like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or other neurodegenerative diseases, we're actually thinking about like harnessing them and the positive aspects of these cells in terms of gobbling up um, uh, large plaques or uh, dead neurons. And so a lot of our projects sort of focus on how to be able to do that and make our own little, you know, Pac-Man microglia. Um, and so I know Karen sort of, you know, worked a lot on this. So uh, I think coming up with ways to do that and understanding how human genetics ties into controlling these cells has been really cool. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. Karen, do you want to take another stab and then? Yeah, maybe just real quick. So what one of the yeah. things work on a lot here is um, the lipid or the fats that might build up in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So this finding is actually one of the first three findings that Alzheimer himself, so Alzheimer, Alois Alzheimer was a, a German scientist um, who first described a patient with Alzheimer's disease. So he looked at her brain and realized that there were a few things that looked abnormal. So one was these amyloid beta plaques, one was tau tangles, and the third was actually these like fat globules that clogged up the brain. So that was a very prominent finding, but up until, you know, really the last five or 10 years, no one's really studied this third finding. Most of the field has focused on studying amyloid beta plaques and tau tangles. And we just really haven't had the, the tools or the kind of background understanding to, to profile fats in the brain. So a lot of my work at Denali is looking at these fat globules kind of dissecting them out of the brain and um, through mass spec, being able to break down these fats and determine what exact species of lipids are in there. And then once we know what's in there, what species of lipids and fats are in there, we can start to um, kind of target each one um, to see, you know, to think about what its function is and what it's doing in the brain and how it's causing the brain to malfunction. So that's a project that I'm really excited about working on. Molly, would you like to field the question as well, and then we can wrap up or? Yeah, sure. I can be pretty quick. So I think um, one of the things that, that I would characterize as a really fun, really cool project is, you know, when we're not thinking about developing therapeutics, we're also thinking about how to better understand the biology of these, these different disorders. So uh, someone in a group came to me and said, you know, what I'd really like to do is, is have a way to label different cell types. And one of the things that we're worried about is when we use a green fluorescent protein, um, the pH of, of where this is going to be trafficked is really low and we can't get a really great vis visualization of that particular section. So can we work with you and use AEV as a method to deliver this fluorescent protein? Because as I mentioned before, we can you know, engineer the exterior of the virus to target a, a particular cell type but we can also add a promoter that's only going to be expressed in a certain cell type as well. And so working together with this other group to develop this tool was a lot of fun for me because it was something that's not, you know, my normal day-to-day -day project, but something that was really cool and really fun to do. Fantastic. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, if there are any more uh, lingering questions, I'm gonna just share my screen again. Um, second. Uh, to just quickly discuss sort of our diversity initiatives and other sort of opportunities at uh, Denali. Okay. Um, so Denali is really committed to, uh, at this point and really for the long-term future, recruiting uh, for a diverse 
um, inclusive workplace environment. And so we have a summer internship program that's uh, sort of geared towards undergraduate and graduate students, um, as well as a postdoc program that Karen's actually a part of. Um, and so uh, both of these are sort of geared towards, um, you know, getting new talent. And I think it's really important, as you heard in the video, of um, really inspiring you all to pursue your interest um, in STEM. And I think often sort of the representation in, in sort of biotech and, and industry is something that we don't really talk about in terms of what roles are available. Um, so if anything, I think that's like a key takeaway here um, is that there is sort of a diversity of roles open um, in neuroscience uh, outside of academia. And I don't know, Karen or Molly, in sort of the last minute, do you all have anything else to add regarding sort of these, these programs or Denali in general? Yeah, I can just say as, as a postdoc here, we're a very small program, but it's been a great place to kind of further my training in, in neuroscience and to kind of go more from basic science and, um, you know, uh, bench more towards the bedside. So, you know, we're working on, I'm, I'm excited to work on drugs that will eventually help a, a human being. So I think, yeah, being able to train here with people from all realms of drug development has really been a great experience. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, the internship program that Denali has is a really great way for people to get exposed to a side of science that they might not traditionally see, particularly if they're in an academic setting as an undergraduate or a graduate student. So it's a really great way to explore an alternate career pathway. Yes, and, and hopefully you've seen from our videos um, that, you know, there's basic research, there's translational research, there's clinical research sort of um, all along the pipeline. Uh, so even if you don't really wanna work with cells or animals or other opportunities to really get involved um, to bring you know, drugs from, from bench to, to bedside. So I think with that, we'll uh, sort of conclude this session and, and thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.